Act of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Thank you for joining me today on the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. It is great to be here. We are concluding this this group of psalms, Psalms 113 to 118, that um, were used in traditional Jewish uh, celebrations to um, as part of a liturgy. Uh, the, these 113 through 118 were used to celebrate festal, festal occasions. In Jewish tradition. And so 118 that we are looking at today is the last of those. And so it concludes this section associated with the celebration of the Passover. And as the last song of the group, it may have been the final psalm in mind when Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. And Jesus quoted verses 22 and 23, about himself in Mark 12, Matthew 23 and Luke 13. And the people greeted Jesus' triumphal entry with shouts of joy taken from this particular song in Mark 11, Mark 10, Luke 19, and John 12. And so the main speaker here is likely the king. You will see that in the references of this psalm. But the psalm as a whole is a liturgy with other speakers as well, which is why the musical setting that I have set involves spoken text, reading the psalm. I used this psalm uh, several times in a previous church that I served where we would sing the refrain and then I would have different readers read portions of the psalm. So it is a unique and creative way to read scripture in the context of corporate worship, but also involve the entire congregation. So, the references to the altar, the temple, and the procession show that it was used in corporate worship. In other words, this is this psalm, Psalm 118, was used for the purpose of liturgy. Since the psalm is read during the recording, I will not read it, but I will give you my commentary, and then you can hear the recording, the setting with the red psalm. So, it begins in verse 1. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And everything is derived from that overarching theme there. His steadfast love endures forever. This is a refrain of this psalm that is repeated quite often throughout the psalm. In fact, the next three or four verses end with his steadfast love endures forever. Verse 5, out of distress I called on the Lord. The I there, this is the king, the king of Israel. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. And this is the heart of the covenant of grace, God siding with his redeemed. The implication for the psalmist is that he has nothing to fear from anyone because God is in control. And I hope that we as believers can take claim, hold on to that truth. Victory is not guaranteed by superior forces or weapons. It is a gift from God. May we never think that any um, anything we achieve, any victory we achieve, whether in a physical battle or in a in life in corporate settings, whatever the case may be, may we never think that that is of ourselves. May we always be humble to the point to realize that everything good that happens comes from God alone. When an athlete succeeds, that is not of himself. And, and you may think, well, the athlete is the one out there working. The athlete is the one working out and getting better at his his craft. But God is the one who ultimately controls that and can take it away at any moment. Verse 12. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. So the simile here has two sides. Thorns with their sharp points 
are apt descriptions of an enemy, but they also burn quickly, like an enemy running away. And so as the thorns are sharp, when they catch on fire, they've burned very quickly. And as, as people of God, our enemies are turned away quickly when God acts. Verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. So for the psalmist, the salvation in view is victory in battle. Keep in mind, he is the king. Verse 15, glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. Israel responds to God's help by singing victory songs that rejoice in God's salvation. In other words, they realize the victory is not from them, but from God alone. Also in verse 15, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand, this is symbolic of the arm that is used to wield the sword in battle. Verse 19, open to me the gates of righteousness. That is the entrance to the sanctuary leading to the presence of God, where the psalmist will offer thanks. The gates are righteous because the one who dwells behind them is righteous. And those who enter should be righteous as well. I'm reminded of Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand at his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. In other words, no one is is capable of entering the presence of God except through the blood of Christ, the mediation of Christ. Verse 21, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Again, as, as in verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song he has become my salvation. The psalmist's salvation in view here is victory in battle. Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The metaphor here would likely refer originally to the king who represented his people. The stone was cast off in despair when defeat seemed inevitable. And victory was no longer a realistic hope. But, he says, the cornerstone, the, this low and insignificant despite having been rejected, is exalted to the chief place. Jesus later applies this passage to himself in Matthew 21, Mark 12, Luke 20, Acts 4, and 1 Peter 2. So Jesus is the cornerstone. Paul says this in Ephesians 2.20. He is cast away by earthly rulers of his day, but exalted to the right hand of the Father. And to some this is a cause of stumbling. And we see this in 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So to some, this cornerstone is a cause for stumbling, but to others, it is the basis of hope. For us, God's people, it is the basis of hope. Verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. So because of God's victory, his people will turn the day of despair into a day of worship before the Lord. Verse 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Later, this cry is lifted up by the crowds as they welcome Christ into Jerusalem in Matthew 21. And in a way, still beyond their understanding, Jesus was about to defeat sin and death on the cross. Verse 27, the Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords. The festal sacrifice, this was the sacrifice performed in public and it was worship before the Lord. And then he concludes in verse 29, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Again, everything is derived from this theme. So the psalm is framed by his steadfast love endures forever. It ends as it begins. So this psalm takes the, um, the last two verses. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. 
And, and it uses that as the refrain. So that is repeated throughout the setting. And then the rest of the psalm is divided into three portions and read. If you were to use this in the context of corporate worship, you could have one person read it, or you could have multiple people read different portions of the psalm. In fact, you wouldn't even need to... I have divided it here into three portions, but you could divide it into six or seven portions, into two portions, whatever would work best in your worship context. Uh, but for the recording here, it is divided into three different sections of spoken text, and the refrain begins and ends and is sung throughout the setting. So, here is Psalm 118 set to music. Thank you for listening today to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. distress I called on the Lord the Lord answered me and set me free the Lord is on my side I will not fear what can man do to me the Lord is on my side as my helper I shall look in triumph on those who hate me it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly.
I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Endures forever 